from an industry standpoint, you know, there's like this war of talent and trying to figure out, you know, how we can get advisors. And it's really difficult to hire like senior advisors, right? And so our view is that, you know, if we can find people earlier in their career, help them develop their skill sets, right? And watch them over time that that's going to create a really great opportunity for them. And it's going to be really beneficial for the firm and our clients. Welcome, Model FAs, and I am very excited to have today's guest, Jeremy Berger from Merriman in the Pacific Northwest. The reason why I'm excited to have Jeremy on the books for this show is uh, really a few reasons. Number one is he has a pretty unique story as to how he became CEO of his firm. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. Second is he's just an awesome dude. And third, he's a client of ours, him and his firm. And it's always great to meet new people on these shows, but it's also great to highlight some of our existing relationships as well. So before I welcome Jeremy to the show, let me start off with his bio just to give everyone some context as to who you're going to be hearing from today. So Jeremy is the CEO of Merriman Wealth Management, a registered investment advisory firm with three different offices across the Pacific Northwest. And through organic growth and two acquisitions in the past four years, his firm currently serves about 2,200 households across the country, managing approximately $3 billion of AUM. Merriman is an established firm of intellectually curious, motivated people that combine technical expertise with compassion and empathy. Working with their advisors, I can certainly say that that is extremely true. Just as a side note, Jeremy, you got awesome people working with you. Merriman believes uh, true wealth is not just accumulating money, but also enabling clients and those they care about to live a fuller life. Our advisors or their advisors, I should say, are trained to understand the relationship between money, the control it gives clients over how they spend their time, and the powerful and universal influence that it has on their happiness. Jeremy joined Merriman in November of 2007. Talk about good timing there at the peak of the market, soon to be the demise of the market at that time. Uh, as a wealth advisor, uh, he became the director of advisory services in July 2014 and ultimately became CEO 10 years after joining the firm in January of 2017. Today, he spends his time ensuring that Merriman is effectively empowering their clients to live fully. Uh, it's one of their mantras in the organization. Actually, Jeremy just got some AirPods that he's not wearing today because of the audio it was a little funky, but he got some AirPods that say live fully on them. So good branding on your end. So to help clients live fully and ensuring that Merriman can attract and retain the right people to help them serve their clients throughout their lives. So Jeremy, appreciate your time and welcome to the show. Great. It's great to be here. I look forward to the conversation. Awesome. So let's dive into your story. So you joined an already established firm. So if I'm not mistaken, you were at another RIA beforehand. You come and join Merriman and quite frankly, within what, a month or two, the market just dropped. Merriman didn't even hire another advisor for a handful of years, you know, based on the circumstances. What was your life like in those moments? It's interesting to like reflect back on that time, right? So yeah, I, I joined Merriman. I think my start date is like November 27th or 26th, 2007. And obviously we're working with you guys, which we really value and thinking about business development. But when I got hired and throughout the interview process, one of the things that stuck out to me was that Merriman had been growing extremely rapidly. And so, you know, I was kind of positioned or coming in as you're going to meet with clients. You're going to have three meetings a day with prospects, don't need to follow up. They're going to bring their checkbook. And really you just get us, you know, serve clients. And almost immediately that was, you know, no longer true. Right. And so especially in right before that, we had merged with a CPA firm and they were trying to integrate those two organizations and we weren't prepared for it yet. Like I think we would be now, but mm -hmm. anyway, as that was happening, we were re-evaluating that integration. So there was a lot of change happening, right? And I had no clients. There was no prospects coming in and they had done their first round of layoffs in early 20, uh, 2008 that had ever happened in the company mainly the CPA firm, but it was a very stressful time. And I was going through the CFA level two during that period, but 
I think what my goal during that period or how I, my thought process was, I just want to do anything and everything I can to make this firm better. And to help the people, I know the advisors, especially they were, you know, they were on the phone with clients, really trying to help them make smart decisions with their money and anything I could do to help ultimately was going to help the firm and help the clients. And so I was kind of a madman. I helped with our research department, our finance department. And ultimately, I think as we got further into 2008, there was a period where, you know, they ended up going through a second round of layoffs. And pretty much every day I thought I was going to get let go. Mm -hmm. And the day they did the second round of layoffs, they came back to me and said, after telling me my boss was looking for me and they couldn't find me and uh, she walked me in the door, crawling. she walked me into the door, closed the door behind me. I totally thought I was going to be calling my wife, telling her I got let go. But luckily, Jeff Merriman, actually our, our former CEO, came to my office and he said, you know, Jeremy, your name was on the list today. We were going down the list and your name was on the list. And when we got to your name, we thought, you know, um, we're not going to be able to like hire you back in a year. Right. And so we're going to basically eat the cost because I had no clients. Right. We're going to eat the cost, you know, want you to be here long term. And that's a moment of, I feel like grace and confidence, right. From the Merriman team that they had in me well before I even had in myself that really, I think, you know, still sticks with me to this day. Well, it's interesting too, because based on the information that you shared just then in terms of, you know, helping with various aspects of the organization, you know, because quite frankly, since you didn't have any clients, you didn't have anything else to do, but you could have easily right. sat back and, you know, collected the paycheck and just kind of like wrote it out. And what my guess is the folks at the top saw that you were willing to help and willing to be a team player and willing to provide value where you could. And if you didn't do those things, you probably would have been let go that day. Yeah, without question, right? Like I definitely <laughs> was low man on the totem pole. You know, most of the numbers, right, would have shown that I should be let go. And I think, yeah, I really just tried to say yes, look for opportunities where I thought, you know, I could add value. And some of those opportunities were things I really enjoyed and I learned a lot and I got a broad perspective of the organization. Some of them were things that, you know, weren't necessarily that enjoyable, but needed to get done. And again, I just wanted to, besides the fact I wanted to keep my job, I also knew the importance of helping clients get through what was a very difficult time. And anything I could do to help the advisor who I was, that was kind of my client at the time, I knew ultimately ended with a better outcome for our clients. Cool. Well, I think is really interesting. So in our call that we had in advance of this, oftentimes people assume, at least I assume that if someone's running an organization, right at the CEO level, like you are, it's interesting to me that you're not this way. So what I had asked you is, have you always had that like entrepreneurial itch? Like, did you have businesses in like high school or college and, you know, things along those lines? Because that's what I would assume someone who rises to the top has always had that in their blood. And I was shocked when you came back and said, no, that's not how I am. So I feel like there's a lot of advisors out there who may not be proactively aspiring to become a CEO at the organization that they're a part of because they haven't had that entrepreneurial blood flowing through their system before. So for those folks who are out there and listening to this, how did you rise to the occasion when that moment was presented? Yeah, well, you know, it was a long time in the making. And I think for me, you know, especially throughout that process, right? Like it wasn't till very close to actually kind of getting offered the CEO job that really I said, you know, yes, this is what I want. And I'm going to advocate for that. Right. Like, I think it was a much more natural progression for me where I think, you know, my interest and where I think my skill set was, you know, again, constantly thinking about how can I better myself while at the same time, like, benefiting the organization and helping everybody like lift all boats. Mm -hmm. Right. And so 
throughout that period, I just, every time I thought about, hey, I think we could do this a little bit better. I see a problem. I'm going to try to solve it or try to figure out what to do. I was always trying to do it in that context. And, you know, I took opportunities that came my way and I created opportunities for myself, not with the end goal of being CEO, but with just the end goal of this is what I think we can do to make the organization better. So there did become a point where, and I think this is true for any advisor that probably, you know, may aspire to be either the CEO or, you know, a more, you know, kind of company-wide leadership as opposed to an advisor is, you know, there was a period in time where I remember kind of having to make a decision, like which path did I want to go down? And that was, you know, at times that was a scary proposition, right? Because one, I love serving clients. It jazzes me up. I love closing business, right? And so I love all of those things, but I also know that, you know, you can't do everything, right? And there becomes a point where even if you do, you don't do them as well as you could. And so I think for me, making that decision of, okay, I want to help lead the advisory team. And then that led to, okay, I want to be on, you know, the board of the company. And, you know, then I want to do X, Y, Z and constantly making sure that, okay, this is the right path. And that means I'm probably not going to do as much on the advisory side, but that's where I think I can make the biggest impact in the organization. So before I share my takeaways from that, because it's there are two main takeaways, I would ask you, and you may not have like an exact number or anything like that. So it's more of like a gut check. You mentioned that you created opportunities through like sharing ideas and kind of like the vision and direction of the firm. How many of the ideas that you had were actually implemented? I would imagine anyways that like, out of, you know, all these ideas, only a handful of them actually stuck. Did that hold true for you? Or is every idea that you have, you know, good? (laughs) (laughs) Talk to the fellow people that you connect with at the firm. That's definitely not true. I don't know of a number. I think there's incremental change. And then there's, you know, change that I think really can make a big difference. And I think one of the you know, I think on the big change, it was probably two or three ideas, yeah. right? That I thought, hey, this is something that I really think is going to push the organization forward and is a very different way of doing things than we've done it in the past. You mentioned the Associate Advisor Program earlier. That definitely is a big one. And also just helping push the firm from really investment management to wealth management, which, you know, now doesn't seem like everybody kind of talks about wealth management, yeah. it's not as like new or cool now. But for us, you know, when we were really doing this, you know, 10, 11, 12 years ago, it was still a little bit new. And there was, you know, we all have our own biases. We have our ingrained, like what we've been doing, right? And it was a lot of work to not only like, you know, build out the process for Merriman and think about how we're going to do it, but really a lot of it's the, you know, how do you build buy-in within Mm. the organization, right? Like I can tell you to do something. Right. Might even do it, but clearly that's not going to create lasting change, like getting buy in for the vision that we're trying to go to. And that was a lot of work, but you know, one of the things I'm probably most proud of throughout my time there. Cool. The two takeaways that I was alluding to that you mentioned is just saying yes to everything and then figuring it out. Mm -hmm. So, like, I have a saying when I ran our new advisor development program when I was an advisor. It's called FIFO and it stands for figure it the F out. Um, (laughs) So I feel like that'll be a title of my book. That seemed like an after hours conversation, David. That's a little teaser, Jeremy. Okay, perfect. Oh gosh. I mean, so just saying yes, as opposed to like, oh, well, I don't know. Like I haven't done that before. Like kind of those like sheepish sort of, you know, responses where instead it's yes. Right. And then you go and figure it out so that you elevate yourself and prove yourself through the value you provided and your ability to FIFO, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second takeaway that I had was you've shared a bunch of ideas. You weren't shy to put yourself out there and be vulnerable. How old were you in 2008 to 2010, roughly? I was in my late 20s. Late 20s. So you're dealing with an executive team who imagine had gray hair, right? Uh, which you're one of the few CEOs in the industry that doesn't have gray hair. Congratulations. I know. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So you're sitting in this boardroom, so to speak, 
and you're putting yourself out there as a kid, right? Yeah. Compared to them yeah. and not being shy to do so. And lo and behold, some of those things stuck. So I want to talk more about the associate advisor program, because what I shared with you before, at least now, and it may have been then, but at least now, this isn't a brand new idea, but I feel like in firms of your size, it is rare that someone has figured out how to implement that in a smooth fashion. And having worked with you guys now going on over two years, like we're now working with the new set of associate advisors, right? So I'm kind of seeing where they start, where they end up working with the more veteran advisors. And if it's clear to me from the outside looking in, it's probably pretty clear to people internally as far as like, this is step one and this is step two and this is step three. And people can cast their vision and have a good, you know, roadmap to actually get there. So help me understand for those of us that are listening and they're like, well, what is an associate advisor position? Are they, are they power planners? Like, what is it that they do? Why do they start there? And then where do they ultimately end up? It's a super important program within the organization, right? I mean, I think this is where, you know, the future uh, on the advisory side, right? Obviously, there's a lot of back office people that have, you know, that we also spend a lot of time thinking about career pathing. But Mm -hmm. I think on the advisory side, right, this is where a lot of the future leaders of the organization are going to come from, right? And I think from an industry standpoint, you know, there's like this war of talent and trying to figure out, you know, how we can get advisors. And it's really difficult to hire like senior advisors, right? And so our view is that, you know, if we can find people earlier in their career, help them develop their skill sets, Mm -hmm. right? And watch them over time that that's going to create a really great opportunity for them. And it's going to be really beneficial for the firm and our clients, right? So the associate advisor, really, we view it kind of as advisor in training. And so, you know, they help in many ways with the advisor relationship. Some of it is, you know, learning some of the technical skills, right? And obviously working towards getting their uh, certified financial planner designation or whatever the case may be, but, you know, really trying to dig into the financial planning, Mm -hmm. right? Helping us build out the financial plans for clients. So that's probably step one is really trying to get some of the technical skills down. You know, then as somebody progresses, right? And they might be in the meetings at first taking notes and doing some of the follow-ups. You know, then the vision is for them to be much more active in the review meetings, much more active in the prospect meetings, Mm -hmm. and allowing an opportunity for them to be presenting to clients, presenting to prospects, and allowing then the advisor that they're working with to provide feedback, right? Mm -hmm. Provide mentorship, right? And one of the things that we strive for is, you know, not only allowing the advisors to work with a number of associates, but a number of the associates to work with the advisors, right? Because what sometimes can happen too, when you get paired with like one person, they might do it exactly the way that you want. They might do it totally differently, but, you know, they're going to have their process. And at Merriman, we try to institutionalize as much as possible, but I liked your acronym earlier about figuring it out, right? Like, I think we we try to make it a very consistent client experience, but we also allow for people's personality and their own skill sets to evolve. So that's an opportunity for them to see, hey, here's, you know, a couple successful people that They do the baseline, say, you know, we have a core investment philosophy of those things, but they might do things a little bit differently based on the personality and it gives a broader perspective, right? And then ultimately, right, we start transitioning some clients to them or them bringing in some clients, working with their own, and then ultimately, you know, trying to become an advisor and a partner in the firm. And so it's building not only the technical skill set, but also while they're building that skill set, how do we also start to build some of the business development mindset and skill set around advancing relationships and really intentional and thoughtful about how we're going to connect with people to build those over time. Hey, Model FAs, I know you're enjoying this conversation, but I wanted to take a quick break to talk to you about the Model FA Accelerator. This is a unique collaboration between us and you, where we help you build a financial advising practice that you can be proud of. We focus on the foundational concepts around how to pick a niche or a specialization, how to price your services, how to construct an offer that people are going to buy, and then how to market it and sell it in a way that'll get people to sign on the dotted line and become clients of your firm, all while giving you the information to scale and set up workflows and 
operational processes that will allow you to reclaim your time and build a practice that doesn't run you. So if you'd like to hear more about that, go to www.modelfa.com forward slash accelerator or www.modelfa.com. Hover over, work with us and click on accelerator. Hope to see you in the program. So I like that a lot. And my mind is moving a million miles an hour right now. So, and I say that because, so I come from a totally different model. So you're fee only, right? I come from the eat what you kill commission based type of model where you're making fees off of the investment portfolio, you know, commissions off of insurance planning, things like that. And the model that I came from is like I said, eat what you kill. And I don't think either model from the point of view of like, where are you going to be more successful? I don't think the models are right or wrong in terms of where you're going to be successful. Now we can have different philosophies as to what's best for the client, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I think that in the model that I came from, what ends up happening is only a handful of people actually make it, even though a lot of people could have made it. And they're focused on sales first as opposed to knowledge first. And then what ends up happening is you just go out and you sling whatever's going to pay your bills that month. And you just have that inherent conflict of interest and not necessarily conflict of interest between, you know, products and clients or services and clients, but paying your bills or not. Yeah. Right. So what I really like about your model is I feel like it casts a wider net as to who and how many people can be successful. Because in my model, like there were great people that are very intelligent that just couldn't cut it at the beginning stages. And then they get discouraged and they go and do something else and potentially miss out on a fruitful career in the financial services industry. Whereas your model, I like that it, A, you pay a salary so that they don't have to worry about paying their bills. You help them getting their designations and you focus on the technical skills and the planning skills first because then when it comes to the point where they're in client conversations and starting to manage relationships, ultimately they're going to have confidence knowing that they can actually hang in a conversation. And then they, what you're also doing a good job at is promoting that joint work Mm -hmm. to provide feedback back and forth. You're also, as opposed to, you know, an advisor who's, you know, going to retire, just dumping all their clients, you know, on someone and potentially, experiencing a lot of attrition for the firm, you're integrating them years in advance. So it's like the utmost, you know, smooth transition. So I think that the model that you've put together, which, you know, I've come across other firms that have something similar is something that I think the whole industry needs to adopt. And even the firm that I come from, it's, they're starting to do that a little bit more, but it's an advisor who's building out their own team. It's not the organization itself. So you have to hope that you come across a, an entrepreneurial business owner, not just a salesperson who happens to be selling financial advice. Yeah, that's right. You know, it goes to what the organization values, right? And, you know, like sales, business development, whatever you want to call it, right, is like growth for the organization, right, is somewhat the lifeblood, right? When we talk about providing career paths for people, when we talk about, you know, helping people meet their financial goals, right? You know, growth provides a lot of that, right? But I think at the end of the day, you know, we value that expertise and empathy, right? And, you know, it's a unique thing in our industry, and you highlighted it where, you know, there's people that are extremely good at sales that mm-hmm. you wouldn't want to touch your family's finances with a 10 foot pole, right? And they make, you know, very healthy livings, you know, good for them, right? And then there's other people that are extremely knowledgeable, but they can't connect with people, right? And so I think what we're trying to do is say, hey, this is what we value. This is how we're going to build out the model. And it also provides as you said, it brings in a different skill set, right? And when we think about having a diverse workforce, when we think about providing opportunities for people that maybe otherwise wouldn't have got it, or like you said, Mm -hmm. right, get discouraged before they, you know, it's like, okay, well, my friends and family don't have any money, right? Or whatever the case may be, like, you're discouraging a large part of the population from having an opportunity in something that they might be extremely talented at, right? And so I think when you build a good team, right? You need a lot of different types of players. You don't need, you know, you can't build a Super Bowl winning team with, you know, five Tom Brady's, right? Like, you know, Tom Brady. I don't know, man. I, know Maybe you you him, could. I don't know that you want Tom Brady as your receiver, right? Like, <laughs> and so, you know, 
what we try to do, especially early on, is help build those skill sets. And then, you know, and you've worked a lot with us on this, and I think on the associates even more is, you know, try to help them, you know, kind of empower them to figure it out, right? Figure out what they're passionate in, right? And then we try to create opportunities that align with what the company needs and what their skill sets provide. And the sooner we can do that in an organization, we think the better. Well, I think too, as you continue to scale and we're starting to get to this point with you guys. So you're familiar with our advisor DNA assessment that our team created. And essentially, for those of you who may not know what that is, the advisor DNA assessment, we believe that people derive energy from certain types of activities in the business. So the four DNAs that we've come up with are called the connector, the rainmaker, the guardian, and the architect. And the connector is that salesperson, quite frankly. And that person is awesome to get someone excited, to cast a vision, to edify the next person that they're going to be meeting with, right? But to actually put together the recommendations like part of the reason, you know, I love developing other humans and specifically advisors. And that's why I got into the consulting space. But part of the reason was when I basically graduated from selling insurance to then getting into the investment space, I just wasn't smart enough in that regard to really be able to do that and be able to, you know, say with confidence that they're going to be in a good spot. It was just complicated. And I think that's the first time I've actually admitted that. So you got me being vulnerable on here, Jeremy, but I feel like that just wasn't where my skill set was. I wasn't an architect. I wasn't the person who likes to crunch the numbers, right? I'm on the front end, right? So then you have the rainmaker and the rainmaker is someone who's really good at identifying, you know, problems and opportunities and presenting solutions and getting people to actually take action specifically on something that's intangible, right? It's not like they're buying a widget, right? And then, you know, from there, the guardian is the person who's actually taking care of that, you know, client relationship moving forward, making sure to deliver an exceptional grade A experience. And then the architect behind the scenes is truly crunching the numbers and everyone needs to know what other folks are doing so that you can be supportive of one another and make sure that you're singing to the same tune, so to speak. But ultimately, as the organization grows, it's making sure that people are just quite frankly on the right seats of the bus. Yeah. And they derive energy from their work because if they're exhausted at the end of the day, it's probably because they're doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, that's right. And oftentimes, right, there's something that they don't enjoy doing that somebody else really does. Right. Right. And so it's like, how do we pair those people to create the best team to go out and serve our clients? And, you know, it's a, we've been doing it for a number of years now. I think, you know, we're constantly trying to think about, you know, how do we develop this? Like, right, you know, it's now we have, you know, 50 employees roughly, right? How does this work when we have 100 employees, Mm -hmm. right? And thinking about down the road, you know, how do we constantly going out looking for people that we think are going to fit Merriman well, have the right skill set? How do we attract them in? How do we create great opportunities for them, give them the training and do it at, you know, 50 people as well as, you know, hopefully 100 people. Gotcha. So usually I wait for this until the end in regards to sharing what your favorite book is. So for those of you who this may be your first episode, but I do in all these episodes is I ask our guests what their favorite book is. Selfishly, I want to know some new books to listen to. I listen to them. I don't read them. And I also want to promote learning for our industry. I feel like there's a lot of us who have become complacent and are not learning something new every single day, or if they are learning something new every day, typically it's related to the industry, which of course you need to do and stay up to date and things like that. But there's so much value in outside resources and outside perspectives, which is why you know I've woven this into the podcast. But the reason why I want to bring this up now, so the book is called, is by Marshall Goldsmith, and it's called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And I had the opportunity to listen to this before our call, And one of my biggest takeaways was the idea of as a leader, right, soliciting feedback from the people in your organization, because we have what are called scotomas, which are blind spots, where we may think that we're doing everything right. But when people give us feedback, we're like, oh, 
I didn't even realize that I was doing that or that I wasn't doing that. Like, thank you so much. So like checking in with your folks along the way, if you're constantly looking to learn, constantly looking to improve and constantly looking to grow as a leader. And Jeremy, you mentioned your favorite part of the book and hopefully you didn't stop here, but your favorite part of the book (laughs) is the title. So again, the title is, you know, what got you here won't get you there. So you guys, when you had joined the firm, you were at 1.6 billion in client assets, and now you're just over 3 billion in client assets. So what got you to the 1.6 didn't necessarily get you to the three, because from my understanding, you were more simply managing assets and bringing people through a true just sales process. And you shifted over to holistic planning, right? You grew to 3 billion. So my question is, if you had to cast a vision for the future, what got you here? isn't going to get you there. What's ultimately going to get you there? Well, luckily I didn't stop at the title. (laughs) Just to make this clear. (laughs) Yeah, just to make clear, I didn't stop at the title. I first actually read it just quickly right before I joined Merriman uh, is the first time I read the book when I was actually at the prior firm. Mm -hmm. And actually reading that book is one of the things that led me ultimately to change firms, right? Because you know, I could see that one of the main things that it talks about is that like, oftentimes people who've gotten a certain level of success, the bad habits they have, they think they got there because of that, right? Mm -hmm. And that that will just continue, right? And I could tell that that wasn't true. And there was a ceiling to kind of where I was and the people that I was working with. And that if I wanted to aspire for more, right, that I was going to have to go, you know, go somewhere else. And so, but, you know, I think we've spent the last, you know, couple of years really continuing to refine our service offering and really set the team up, like get the right people in the right seats at the right time for the organization and, you know, giving them enough tools to develop their skill sets, like just a rigid process where we don't allow them to figure it out, right? I think our goal is to empower people with the tools and then you know, help them flourish in their own ideas, right? Like we talked ideas earlier, right? Like I don't have a monopoly on good ideas. I think Mm -hmm. that's very clear if you talk to some of my other coworkers, right? And so we want people to be able to test things, try them out and figure out what's going to work for them and ultimately what will help push, you know, the firm forward. So I feel like that we've been building that base now of really getting the right people in the right seats. And now, you know, I think it's going to be, continued uh, execution on two fronts. One is going to be on, you know, growth, right? And how we think about where we get clients from. And so, you know, referrals are a major component of the business. I think they'll continue to be, we're working with you guys a lot on that, but we're also actively testing and trying new ways of reaching people, Mm -hmm. right? And I think that will continue to be an iterative process in thinking about how to capture new people, you know, to the firm that maybe don't know us right now and attract them. And then I think from a service offering standpoint, you know, it's continuing to institutionalize and systematize like those things that we spend, you know, you talked about the investments earlier. We spend a lot of time trying to get our clients basis points of improvement, but that's something that's consistent across the firm. So how do we make that component of the process as systematized as possible, but personalized to the client. Mm -hmm. So they feel like they're getting a custom experience, but we have a really good backend. And then thinking about, okay, going forward, right? It's kind of been wealth management and that would be a continued process, but how else can we add value in our client lives, right? And I think really trying to understand what are those things that we might be able to do internally? And what are those things that we need to partner with the right organizations to help our clients live fully, right? Which really comes down to, you know, understanding how time and money interact with each other and helping them, you know, get more control over their time. Love it. I can say working with you, Tyler and Christy at the top, obviously, and then the advisors of the firm, what's really enjoyable for us is, so you mentioned earlier on in your career, you just said yes to everything and then you figured it out. Yeah. What I really like is that you say yes to our ideas and you let us figure it out. Right. So, yeah. whether, so we like that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess my point in bringing that up is you, not just at the advisor level, but at the firm level, like you're willing to test things. Right. So, like 
you know, we tested, you know, webinars and, you know, in speaking with Frank and Alan, like they're having a blast and they got some good people in the pipeline. And once, you know, COVID, you know, hopefully goes away at some point, we can do seminars again. And we've talked about, you know, starting various podcasts and a lot of your advisors are creating content. Like it's just a breath of fresh air when just for people listening, like Jeremy's not just like saying this stuff, like they're actually doing it as well and trying to be innovative and trying to be different and truly from my perspective, anyways, empowering your advisors, you know, to do like focus on certain niches and understanding, like we just had a session, you know, with Frank and Paige and Alan and Amy, you know, about how they're going to attract certain people. And they came prepared with like such good out of the box ideas. And I know without even having shared it with you, although I did CC you on the notes, but (laughs) I know that like, you're going to be supportive of that stuff, even though they're like totally out of the box because, you know, when you can allow people to pursue a career while focusing on their passions along the way, that just helps. It just helps. So for that, I'm grateful that you guys are like that. Just so you know. Yeah. Well, great. I'm grateful for those advisors you listened and everybody else on the team, right. That they're willing to, you know, get outside their comfort zone. Right. And I think oftentimes, right. When you try new things, right? If you try new things and you never fail, that means you didn't really step out of your comfort zone, right? You didn't really try to innovate something new. And, you know, I think for us, it's this comfortability with the idea that we're going to try things and not all of them are going to work. And that's okay, right? And that we want to be supportive of that throughout the process, right? I'll give you a funny story. Tyler and I, many years ago, We tried to do a number of seminars and we built this, what we thought was outstanding seminar. We practiced, we did all these things and we did not get the results that we wanted, right? And that was uncomfortable, right? And so, but we also said, hey, what can we learn from it, Mm -hmm. right? What can we try to do better next time and how do we move forward, right? And so I think it's that support people along the way, give them the tools, understand sometimes you're going to have things that work incredibly well, and sometimes things aren't going to work and how you bounce back from that and keep moving forward. And then the last thing just quickly I'll say is, and you touched on it, which is that we're trying to allow everybody the opportunity to pursue what's important to them, right? Because I think what happens sometimes as leaders, and I know that this is definitely true in my own experience, I think as I've progressed, hopefully progressed as a leader, (laughs) is we make assumptions, right? And we put people or ideas in boxes. And I think one of the things that I'm consistently reminded of is that like people surprise us, right? And good ideas can come from anywhere, right? And so we're trying to encourage and and support people in trying things. And we're seeing, you know, things that maybe, you know, we wouldn't have thought work, show a lot of results. And those people are super excited, right? Like they're having wins. I mean, it just, it builds on it. And I think now we're seeing that across, you mentioned in one of your notes to me recently, that the feel across the organization is just so much different, right? And I think part of it's because people are having their own success. And I also think we just have a very team-based approach. And it's like, you know, you succeeding doesn't come at the expense of me, right? Like we all can succeed and we all can be better for that. And I think we strive for that each day. I love it. So Jeremy, if anyone has any questions or anyone is interested in Merriman, where can they find you? So I want to make sure, you know, you get a little bit of a plug before we enter into the after hour section. Well, obviously uh, Merriman.com, I'm more active on LinkedIn. And I think, you know, I try to share interesting information, connect with people. You know, those are probably the best places. Awesome. Well, appreciate you joining. We're obviously going to be entering into the next segment right now. But before we do so, thank you for everyone who tuned in today. I think that there's a lot of great nuggets throughout this episode. So as always, make sure that whatever your main takeaway was or main couple takeaways are, put them into action immediately. Don't just listen to this stuff and, you know, be an information zombie where you're the smartest person in the room, but you don't do anything about it. So, you know, make sure that you're taking action. Also, I did mention as well, our advisor DNA assessment earlier today on this show. So that was the connector, rainmaker, guardian, and architect. And if you think that that would be helpful for you, feel free to reach out to me and actually If you would be so kind as to share this episode with someone, 
who you think would find it to be helpful. We'd appreciate that. And also if you subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes, if you take a screenshot of that review and shoot me a text at 978-228-2338, again, 978-228-2338, Send me a screenshot of that. What will happen is you'll get an automated response right away with a quick little form to fill out your name so I know who it is. And then beyond that automated text, it's a direct conversation with me. It's not like a chat bot or anything like that. So if you send me a screenshot of your review and also say advisor DNA in the text, the first three people that do that, I will send you a link to be able to take that assessment And I'll hop on a debrief call with you as well to figure out based on your advisor DNA, where you should be focusing based on your current setup. So as a thank you for going out of your way to make a review quickly, that's what I'll do for the first three people. So again, I appreciate everyone's time and attention. Hope you're enjoying these shows as much as I am. Jeremy, thank you again for joining. And we will see you guys on the after hours portion. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. It was great being here. Awesome. There was a lot of really good stuff in there, man. Thanks. There was a lot uh, of really- yeah. Hopefully, uh, it's funny when you were talking about the actionable things. I was like, okay, well, what was action? Okay, what if I was I think- listening? Like, what would I take away from that? I mean, the two main things that come to my mind, and this is actually good to debrief, you know, during this portion because a lot of people may be thinking the same thing, where it's like, I really like that, but like, what do I do now? I think that it's when presented with opportunities, say yes. Yeah. Number two is. Don't worry about the judgment of others and just bring up the ideas that you have, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that you're speaking up if you think something can be innovative. And then if you're still listening and you have a firm with multiple advisors, like you should have an associates program if you don't already and, you know, model after some of the stuff that Jeremy's done. So hopefully some people maybe who were listening who thought, wow, you know, no firm is perfect, right? But that a lot of what... Merriman's trying to do sounds attractive, right? That they reach out, right? Like we're hiring, right? We're trying to find talented advisors, either starting out in the career who've been here for a while, who want to be part of something bigger. And I think we have a great culture and that, you know, we would love to, you know, talk to more people who are maybe interested in making a move. I was smiling in that last section. This is the after hours section. So I have to tell you a a funny story about- like the first couple months of joining Merriman. So we were, you know, again, we had grown very rapidly. We were doing workshops constantly. We had a podcast voted best podcast by Money Magazine in 2008. We were producing content all the time, but we had a couple articles that were like every year updated, evergreen. Like they were super valuable. All the advisors used them. Workshops, they were used. So I'm a few months into the job. Again, I have no clients. I'm a nobody, right? And there's this article that we're going to post and I'm reading through it and there's this big table and I won't go into all the details, but there's a big table. And I think to myself, I don't think this is right. Like, I don't think we're showing what we think we are and that we need to change it. And so I spoke up and uh, I think, you know, I brought this to, I think, the appropriate level of people. And they were like, yeah, we think it's fine the way it is. And I said, "Mm, I'm not quite there yet. I want to be a team player. I want to jump on board. I don't think we're there yet. So long story short, within my first couple months of being there, as the market's falling, I end up having a meeting with me, the founder, the CEO, the CFO, like the leadership team. Yeah. And basically, it's me explaining why I think the way I think we should present something is right. And Paul Merriman, who I love dearly, you know, saying, no, I think this is still the appropriate, I think we should still do this. And my wife, I remember at the time, my wife saying, Jeremy, you're going to get fired. Can't you just be (laughs) quiet? Like, just move past this. And I was like, no, but I think I'm right. Which, by the way, is a terrible, I've gotten better over the years. But Sure enough, they ended up changing the article. Now you can go back to your wife and say, honey, aren't you glad that I spoke up because I'm running the ship now? (laughs) Yeah, I try not to do that. Actually, you know, Jeff Curran, who's an outstanding advisor on our team. I told him many years ago about a prospect who also earlier in my time in Merriman basically told me, and they were a large prospect. They basically told me that they weren't going to hire me because of my age. Mm. And 
that always has always stuck with me. And Jeff, when I became CEO one time said, you should send him a note and tell him that, you know, you're now the CEO. And uh, if you know Jeff, that would be a very Jeff thing not to necessarily do, but to talk about. But I told him, I was like, I don't think that's very helpful. (laughs) Or you could, one of my favorite podcasts by Andy Frisella is called the MF CEO and it stands for the mother effing CEO. So you can just like, send that prospect a podcast recommendation and they can like deduce what the subliminal. Yeah. <laughs> so before we get into some of the funny questions, I do have a question. So you joined an already established firm. Yep. You were young. I would imagine that you haven't been at the firm the longest right now. There's probably people that either started with you or were hired before you. You got no clients, recession hits. Fast forward 10 years, you're the CEO. When you first became CEO, did you find that everyone was like within the organization was super supportive of that. Did you find that there was any apprehension or maybe resentment? And and how'd you kind of work through that? Because I know that if I joined a firm and did those same things, I feel like there would be some potential apprehension. I also feel like that conflict when handled directly and with some grace ultimately builds relationships. But I guess walk me through that scenario. You know, I've seen that play out with other firms, right? People that it probably depends a little bit on the culture and also like the circumstances. So I think in my specific case, since that's what we're talking about, we have a lot of tenure within the organization, right? So there were a lot of people that, you know, I've been working with from day one, right? Mm -hmm. And I think they saw me progress and saw me in action many years before it was that I was CEO, right? And they saw that progression. And I think that limited any major mm-hmm. conflict, right? Where I think the best succession plans are often the ones that seem natural, Yeah. right? Seem very like, you know, obviously Amazon, you know, Jeff Bezos recently said he was stepping down from CEO and it was kind of a non-event, right? Because the person that he chose was somewhat expected. Everybody already bought into him. And not to say it was totally smooth and there weren't some difficult conversations pre-becoming CEO, but I think luckily, you know, we were kind of able to address those as a leadership team about who we thought was the best position to kind of move the firm forward. And ultimately, then the time came, right? It was a very kind of gratifying and surreal moment of being like, okay, now we're here. I have the support of people and now I have to you know, kind of get everybody moving in the same direction. And, and it worked out pretty well. Cool. Yeah, I like the idea where it wasn't just like, a, you know, oh, dad appointed his son the CEO, because, you know, he wants to keep it in the family. It was you've yeah. been working towards that for 10 years through the actions that you were taking on a daily basis. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think for some people, you know, especially when it got announced, I might not have been next in line. So there was a little bit of surprise, but I think my hope is anyway, that when people kind of stepped back and thought, okay, what do we really want going forward and things like that, that then they said, oh yeah, Jeremy makes a ton of sense and we're going to rally around him. And I think that that was totally the experience, which just has made it even more kind of impactful for me. Cool. A few hot seat questions for you before we wrap up. And these are some would you rather questions? So they're great. And whatever you're thinking they are, they're not because they're totally random. So the first one, would you rather use eye drops made of vinegar or toilet paper made from sandpaper? (laughs) Oh, geez, Louise. (laughs) Probably eye drops and vinegar. Eye drops and vinegar. Yeah. I mean, I use baby wipes every time. So (laughs) so to use sandpaper, like... My rear end would not be very happy. So I definitely put the eye drops too. Would you rather be a clown who distracts the bull or the cowboy who rides the bull? Oh, man. I'm going to say the cowboy because it sounds more interesting. In real life, could I really get on the bull? You know, I don't know, but I like the idea of being on the bull. Well, it's funny because when I first read that, I was like, well, do I want to sound like a badass or do I want to be safe? And, yeah. you know, <laughs> maybe start on the mechanical bull at, at a bar one night. Yes. Final one. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather have to go to the bathroom in a giant litter box in your house or anywhere you want, but you can only do so outside? 
Uh, Mind you, it rains a lot out there. It gets cold out there. Cold, yeah, rain and cold. But then you're tracking sand all throughout the house. So (laughs) yeah, yeah. You know, I even though it does rain a lot here in Seattle, I do like the outdoors, and especially with COVID in Seattle, it's not as easy to get outside as much uh, as it sometimes wise is. So I'm gonna go with outside. Cool. I love that. Like. CEOs of firms at your level and whatnot. I'm just asking these ridiculous questions. So thanks for playing. Yeah, yeah, they're absurd, (laughs) but it's all in fun and it's all in fun. And I really, I mean, I hope that, yeah, that people find it valuable. And I think overall, I'm just super grateful to not only lead, I think, an incredible organization with incredible people, but also to partner with people like you guys um, and the rest of the team at Model FA in helping us, you know, get our exposure out even more because I think, you know, we do great work for clients and want to expand that. So awesome. Well, I appreciate the kind words and the plug towards the end. So thank you very much. And for those of you who stuck around for the after hours portion, hopefully you got a chuckle. Hopefully you got another nugget or two with our debrief and appreciate you tuning in. Jeremy, thanks again for joining. Yeah, thanks so much. It was great being here. Awesome. Take care.